Well, good day, everybody. Randy Franklin Smith here. And today we're going to talk about UEFI boot kits and in particular Black Lotus. And we're going to show you a really cool live demonstration of this. We're going to have to use a webcam because of the nature of the beast when you're messing around in UEFI. Of course, you can't be running GoToWebinar, uh, but it's going to be really cool. And um, I want to thank Eclipsium and uh, Nate Warfield. Nate is uh, a really cool security researcher. Some of you will remember him from past webinars. Nate, thank you for um, having Eclipsium uh, sponsor today's real training for free. And you've got a big part of uh, the educational content today. Really looking forward to your demonstration, Nate. Thank you, Randy. It's always uh, fun to be here, and I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, let's do this. Um, first, I'm going to explain uh, UEFI and Secure Boot very, very briefly, and then talk about UEFI boot kits. Then we will get into specifically how Black Lotus works, and um, we'll also talk about you know why why are we having so many problems with a technology that was supposed to solve a lot of security problems. Nate, it's, uh, I mean, let's be honest, U UEFI Secure Boot is uh, kind of a disappointment. Would you agree? Um, well, I'd say when it works, it works really well. Uh, the problem is, is just the way it was designed and sort of the nature of keeping it updated uh, doesn't make it, uh, it's not very user friendly. Uh, there is a especially significant risk if you're maintaining a fleet of thousands of machines. Uh, when it goes wrong, like if you're trying to, somebody's trying to update it and it goes wrong, it can be rather complicated to, you know, walk a user through it on the phone to restore, uh, get their system back to a usable state. Yeah, very true. Well, let's get into this. The foundation to all of this is UEFI and then Secure Boot. Now, UEFI, that is the, the, the replacement for BIOS. But this is highly functional. You know, Nate, it's safe to say UEFI is like its own operating system that just runs in firmware. There's UEFI applications, drivers, bootloaders. Um, it has its own, you know, entire security framework. It's highly functional. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is the operating system that basically allows your operating system like Windows or Linux to actually do things, right? Without UEFI, you wouldn't have storage drivers. You wouldn't know how to talk to the hard drive or the file system or any of that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, but, you know, with all of that functionality, it's just a law of cyber physics. You also get a large attack surface. And UEFI is designed to be secure, but with a large attack surface. And, and at the end of the day, UEFI is just software. Software has vulnerabilities. That being said, it was designed with security in mind. And when we talk about secure boot, it's hard to, um, you can't separate the hardware from the operating system. So secure boot is implemented partly in UEFI and partly in Windows. The idea behind secure boot is before the OS loads, it's intended to ensure that only trusted firmware, uh, trusted device drivers are loaded. And then, you know, if the system is tampered with, with some added help from TPM, the system should refuse to boot. Um, and then if we get through the firmware portion, then in a highly choreographed, uh, technique, process, step by step, the trusted execution layer is handed over to the operating system. And then the OS takes over, making sure that any code it loads, especially in kernel mode, device drivers, um, have not been tampered with either. Now, before Windows takes over, what is the security based on in terms of the security of checking to make sure malicious software or vulnerable software is not loaded? You have two um, 
you have two databases of signatures, two lists of uh, signed UEFI programs. UEFI programs can be drivers, bootloaders, etc. Um, you have the signed, which is called the DB. So those are valid UEFI components that can be uh, run. One example is Boot Manager, the Windows Boot Manager. Okay, <clears throat> each version of that that is uh, uh, allowed to run it, it has an entry in the DB file. Then um, they were, you know, the the architects of UEFI realized, hey, there could be vulnerabilities discovered in UEFI components, like Boot Manager for Windows. And so they said, we need to uh, make a way to uh, revoke those. And so this is just, this is a lot like a certif certificate revocation list from a certification authority, only it's a list stored in the firmware of your local system. And this is simply a list of those signatures of those UEFI bootloaders, device drivers, et cetera, that have been discovered to have vulnerabilities and thus are revoked. So theoretically, you know, this is our way for dealing with it. We discover a vulnerability in a UEFI component, and so we update the, the DBX to blacklist that. Well, that's in theory. As you're going to see, it turns out to be far more complicated than what I think we ended up with. And, I, you know, Nate, I am thinking that we are just ending up with a lot more vulnerable UEFI components than what the architects of UEFI envisioned. Do you think that's part of the problem? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously the attackers, you know, uh, you know, whether people may have differing opinions on Microsoft, but having worked there for a while, Microsoft has paid a lot, they put billions of dollars into making the actual operating system attack surface much, much harder um, than it used to be in, say, Windows 2000 days. So attackers are starting to look lower and lower in the stack to find places to either exploit or to persist. And the bootloader is a great place because it's generally outside of the purvey of or the purview of the EDR software, um, things like that. So it's uh, and looking at some of the, I did some analysis that we may get to in a bit, but I did look at some of the the numbers of the revocation list, like how many hashes have been put in there. And back in, uh, back in, I think when they first started posting it in 2014, there was, I think, like 60 or 70. And the most recent update from May of this year has something like 375, I think. Um, so it's yeah. definitely, it's, it's, it, the, the numbers keep exponentially growing every time they post a new revocation list. And that's, that's the other part of the problem is different hardware manufacturers produce UEFI applications and get them added to the DB file. But these are not, it's very evident that the, the developers of these UEFI applications have not had security training. And, um, uh, and, and therefore, they're, you know, they're not writing secure code from the first, from from the from the outset, and updating the DBX is not the same as you know just patching Windows. Um, and so it's it's another example of where the theory was great, but in practice, uh, you know the execution has lots of problems. Anyway, let me get off my soapbox and and really show you what we're talking about. So a UEFI bootkit, how does that work? So notice we're using a different term than rootkit. It's similar to a rootkit, um, but in this case, uh, a bootkit is a little bit easier to run uh, and, and to deploy, and you'll see why as we go along. First of all, where does a UEFI bootkit live? It lives in the uh, firmware. Its files are in the EFI partition. Um, and once it gets active, it gives the attacker full control of the booting process. And all of this happens before the operating system loads. And because of that, since we are pre-OS, that gives us power over the operating system 
itself. Um, and at the end of the day, this then means that we, the attacker, get to load arbitrary code that's going to run with what I would call root privilege. Whether we're, you know, whether you're running Linux or or Windows, you are running as part of the trusted code base. And so this then means that you can turn off security features. And the, uh, you know, Black Lotus, for instance, shuts down BitLocker. It shuts down the um, code integrity portion. Uh, it also shuts down other things like Defender. It um, can then start programs in the operating system that run in the kernel space and also user space uh, programs. And that's exactly what Black Lotus does. It has two, once it's finally active and Windows is running, there's two components. One is running in kernel mode, the other is running in user space, and they work together to facilitate both command and control and loading other stuff in kernel space where, you know, all bets are off. You can do anything you want. So a boot kit in UEFI is not as stealthy as um, like Lojax, which some folks refer to as a firmware implant, others refer to it as a UEFI rootkit. But at the end of the day, it gives you nearly the same capabilities and it's far easier to deploy. Some examples of UEFI bootkits, Black Lotus isn't the only one. There were some others before it, but um, it, uh, there, there are a number of things that make Black Lotus unique, as you'll see as we go along. So I think one important thing that we really need to be aware of, because it has great ramifications, it has is very important implications for prevention of UEFI bootkits, and that is you need local admin authority. So the attacker, this is definitely a remotely possible attack. We have to get uh, initial access and execution ability, thinking about MITRE attacks, on the, the endpoint that we're going to take over. And then on top of that, we need local admin authority, assuming this is Windows. Um, that's an important prerequisite, but unfortunately, the vast majority of our users out there, Nate, still run with local admin authority. And if we could just change that, then the whole landscape of Black Lotus and related attacks would change a lot. Do you agree? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely uh, what we, one of the tricks I'm going to use later on is basically just bypassing what Microsoft calls user access controls, which is that pop up when you want to install software that says, hey, you need to run this as admin. Um, that is officially from Microsoft, not a security boundary. So they won't even fix bypasses to that that piece of code. But yeah, it, 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 it just due to the nature of Windows, it's very hard to take away admin permissions from people, but it's definitely, it's it's been a, a sort of thorn in the side of Microsoft for decades. Yeah, yeah, and um, well, at any rate, that is the big important prerequisite here. So we're not showing you anything today that you can do unless you've got local admin authority. But that's still extremely common out there. Now, the other thing that we need is a vulnerable bootloader that's not been revoked in the DBX. Now, bootloaders, they run in a highly privileged con uh, context. And um, if a vulnerable bootloader is available for us to run, then we're going to be able to, depending on its vulnerabilities, disable security checks and then load arbitrary code and execute it during the boot up process. Now, the interesting thing here is it's unnecessary that the vulnerable bootloader be present on the system. And I think this is really interesting, Nate. So Windows has already patched the uh, boot manager components involved in Black Lotus. 
Um, so the, the, the vulnerable bits likely are not on your system if it's up to date. However, Black Lotus just brings its own copy of the vulnerable bootloader and uh, loads that into the EFI partition and takes advantage of it. The reason it's able to is because the signature of the vulnerable uh, bootloader components, boot manager components in, in the case of Black Lotus are not in the DBX yet. Nate, am I doing, how am I doing so yep. far? No, nope, you're absolutely right. That's, that's exactly what it does. And that's what, exactly what I'll do here in a bit. Um, so where does it get the uh, vulnerable copies? It either downloads them from places where they're published on the internet by Microsoft, or it may have an embedded copy of it. Um, and so that's part of the problem here is once a vulnerability is discovered in a bootloader, we have to do two things. We have to patch it, but that doesn't actually protect us unless it's blacklisted. And then, Nate, just because the DBX is published, the other thing is we have to get that DBX onto each endpoint. And it's only at that point, um, I would say there's four steps. So the, the, the bootloader has to be patched. A, a patch has to be published, I should put it that way. Then that patch has to be deployed. Then the DBX has to be published. An update to the DBX has to be published. And then that DBX has to make it to each uh, endpoint. Now, if that if it's a bootloader that is just some third party app that's not as big of a, a deal and in previous webinars i've i've described uh some of them i think one was a um disk encryption program i forget uh nate uh but you remember we talked about some vulnerable bootloaders in the past yeah um, i mean it, it really boils down to when 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 secure boot was invented there was of course the you know, the, some of some in the in the the industry were like, "Wait, is this Microsoft's way of locking out Linux from running on you know laptops and, and endpoints?" So they 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 essentially did they they do what they call as uh, shim signing. So there's a there's a basically a chain of trust um, where other vendors can sign uh, a a bootloader or a shim loader that's then you know trusted and then Microsoft like it, it's the the whole chain of trust is not broken. Um, yeah. So, you know, other, I think this happened with the Kaspersky rescue disk. There was one where they had a vulnerability in there. Um, there was another one that the actual exact one escapes me. It might have been a disk encryption thing, like you're mentioning. But yeah, those third-party bootloaders were found to be vulnerable. The you know the uh, the the UEFI and all of the signature checking has no idea. It just says, well, the signature matches the signature is trusted. I'm going to go ahead and load this thing. And so, my point is that sometimes it's it's more practical and easier to put to publish uh, a signature to the dbx uh, by the ufi authority in microsoft than other times and the, here's a case in this case the vulnerable bootloader is the windows boot manager itself and so no windows system is going to load if we uh if we revoke that signature and don't update the bootloader. And so for that reason, Microsoft finally got around to patching boot manager, but they refrained, they held off from revoking the vulnerable version in the DBX. And so Black Lotus says, okay, well, we'll just bring our own copy of the uh, vulnerable bootloader. Why did Microsoft hold off doing that? Well, if they would have revoked it right away, it put lots and lots of systems in different scenarios at risk for refusing to uh, boot the the next time they tried. Fair enough, uh, Nate? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we will probably cover their, their most recent uh, attempts to patch this later on, right? Yeah. Okay. So... So black. So let's talk about a specific case of a UEFI bootloader, and that is um, Black Lotus. So Black Lotus, one of the key 
elements of Black Lotus is the fact that it uses um, 21894 CVE. Now that is a vulnerability in Boot Manager. Um, and what it does is it takes advantage of a way of editing your uh, BCD options so that you use two BCD boot options together. One is avoid low memory and then truncate memory. Avoid low memory says, okay, don't load the secure boot policy into low memory. It pushes it up higher in uh, your memory address space. And then truncate memory clears that region of higher memory out, which then erases your secure boot policy, which then allows you to turn on other BCD options, such as no integrity checks. So it's a, you know, it's a classic weird combination of settings that uh, somebody out there found and uh, is able to exploit. It's kind of a, yeah, it's your typical Rube Goldberg-ish type of thing where we turn this on, which allows us to turn this off, which then allows us to turn this on. At the end of the day, it allows uh, Black Lotus to then load its own arbitrary code during the boot process. Um, again, Boot Manager has been patched by Windows already, but it's the vulnerable versions are not in the DBX. They're not blacklisted. And so Black Lotus brings its own copies that you see right here, or it downloads them. And uh, all of this results in um, a boot kit that's less than 80 kilobytes in size. It's worth pointing out that uh, so that vulnerability was named Baton Drop. Um, there's proof of concept on GitHub that basically does this exact thing. So they didn't have to write a whole lot of this. They just basically took something from GitHub and modified it to do their purposes. Yeah, that's right. Um, so here's the process. So let's uh, pretend we've got uh, an end user out there. Uh, they have local admin authority. Maybe they have, uh, what was that feature you referred to? Oh, user uh, access control? <laughs> yeah, UAC. Yeah. Maybe that's turned on, but that's meaningless. Well, it's, it's um, enabled all the time. It's just UAC bypass is just a way of getting a user to click yeah. OK on something, thinking that they need to. <laughs> yeah. So they're running with local admin authority. They download something bad. It could start out as a macro in a Word document. Um, so the, the bad guy gets initial access and execution and then bypasses UAC. And so now it runs the actual installer. The installer, bear in mind it has admin authority, so it disables hypervisor code integrity and BitLocker and then it copies its components to the ESP partition uh, where UA UEFI is stored. And um, some of its components are uh, copied to this uh, folder on ESP, and that is um, you know, where Microsoft Boot Manager is actually stored. And then it creates its own folder for additional components. It calls it System32 so that it, you know, it, it doesn't stand out. So that's just a little bit of, uh, uh, I forget which MITRE attack technique that is, but it's just so it, it flies underneath the radar. And then it reboots. This is when it exploits 2.118.9.4 in that um, having modified the BCD options, it succeeds in erasing the um, secure boot policy, which normally turns off a bunch of BCD options that you would, you would normally not want to run, that, might, that Windows normally has turned off. Those in turn disable integrity checks, which then allows it to run its own uh, bootloader. 
and then it enrolls its own machine owner key. So this is interesting. Um, UEFI, in addition to um, checking the DB and DBX files for s signed uh, UEFI components, it also allows um, somebody with the proper authority to sign their own UEFI components with a uh, key that is local to that system. So if you are the owner of the machine, you can enroll your own machine owner key, which um, is now a trusted authority for signing uh, UEFI components. And that's what they do. They enroll their own machine owner key, which then allows their own self-signed, in step three, their own self-signed UEFI bootloader to run. That, so now we're into the second and subsequent reboots, loads its own kernel driver into Windows and a user space, user mode component, which is uh, a downloader. It downloads over HTTP and then executes whatever it downloads. So once uh, Windows is running, then that HTTP downloader will go and get you know, connect to command and control. It'll download additional software and commands, and then it can either run those directly or it can communicate with that kernel mode driver and have uh, commands and other software run up in kernel mode. In addition, the kernel mode device driver um, is also performing other actions of uh, namely disabling uh, other Windows uh, security features like Defender as well as resisting removal. So it keeps um, the files open in the um, EFI partition so that you can't delete them. But all of this is possible because there's a vulnerability in Boot Manager and that, even if that program has been patched, it hasn't been revoked. The, the vulnerable version has not been revoked in the DBX. The bottom line with all of this is that, you know, UEFI and Secure Boot is just a bunch of software. And it's software that has the same capability for vulnerabilities as any other software. And it's very evident that the developers of, of a lot of UEFI software um, have not implemented secure coding practices by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but not only is that the case, the UEFI stuff is harder to update. Part of the problem is you have boot manager out on backup material and um, uh, recovery disks, and lots of other places that you can't just through the ether update, Nate. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. They're offline copies. Now, should we just give up and not use UFI and Secure Boot? No. But we've got to look for opportunities to reduce the number of endpoints where the end user is running with local admin authority. In addition, we've got to know the state of firmware across the devices in our enterprise and then have the ability to update it. Now, if you want to get deeper into Black Lotus, um, there's an incredibly good write-up right there that I've uh, included a link to. But now, let's actually see a Black Lotus type attack happen. And uh, this is where you take over, Nate. And folks, you'll want to watch his webcam uh, because, you know, the stuff we're doing, we don't have the option of, of running uh, go to webinar. So uh, zero in, you might want to expand uh, Nate's webcam. Take it away, Nate. Here. Um, okay. Hold on a sec here. I'm setting this up. So what I'm going to do, okay, whoops, make sure that my, okay, so that looks 
Okay, yeah, there we go. All right, so we got the machine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to basically, I'm starting this just powered off. So we're going to turn this on um, just to, you know, show that I'm not stacking the deck in my favor here. All right, so this is a HP, oh, I forget, Pro Books of some model made in 2021. Um, I apologize to the audience for if this stuff looks a little washed out. Uh, I was not able to get it, the lighting to work any better, but... What we'll do is we'll show some security settings. Don't mind these. This is a laptop I don't set my uh, my account up on. So we can check device security. Um, you can see Secure Boot here is on. Um, you know, core isolation, everything's on. Let's go ahead and check uh, BitLocker. You can see that BitLocker is on, you know, protecting my C drive. Uh, we can go to updates. We'll make sure that this is fully updated. All right. And okay, that looks good. Oh, wow. Well, okay, apparently Defender and .NET released updates since this morning. So we're gonna just skip that. Uh, hopefully I don't have to reboot. Don't really have a choice. This shouldn't require a reboot, it's just .NET. <laughs> okay. Uh, this isn't going to get, uh, you know what, let's just leave that be. So, um, obviously this is all updated. And then the way that I simulate this is a way that attackers have been starting to get into people's systems because of attachment filtering and all the scanning and stuff is they've been sending people ISO, right? They'll send you an ISO image and say, okay, get this thing. So what we did, we built this ISO image. Um, and when you, you know, load this thing up, it's got a setup installer. So this we run and it's a little hard to see, but what this is doing, this is the, let me see if I can zoom in better for you. Uh, it's just going to be washed out and terrible. Um, what this is, is your standard, Hey, you know, this is, this is actually a Microsoft signed installer. Um, you can see kind of here down here at the bottom, it says verified publisher, Microsoft corporation. Um, and what it's just saying is like, hey, you know, you can show more details. It says, oh, this is, you know, everything seems to be fine. You say yes, and this is going to happen a little quickly. So it looks like a driver update. Mm -hmm. And then your Windows, okay. <laughs> the demo gods always strike. So now when this thing reboots, it's going to come up and it's dropping. This is just a demonstration splash screen. This is not a monkey. This is the Mr. Robot of Society mask for anybody wondering. Um, but basically just it's saying is this thing is uh, we, we use this as a demo for our customers. Um, now with that, I'm able to basically run code pre Windows boot. Um, I bypass BitLocker in the process. Obviously, it didn't catch me. So we can still go and check. You know, BitLocker is still enabled, right? Everything's fine there. If we go and look at uh, Secure Boot, Secure Boot, we can see that Secure Boot is still on, right? Nothing's changed here. Um, the problem, as you know, you mentioned, Randy, this boils down to a lack of a DBX update. So what I'm going to show you next is, you know, this machine just came with the DBX update. I have left it at what the factory settings would be. Um, this is not something that most people will update. Now, you can, of course, so this is the process. Oops. Users, user, let's talk. Um, and in here, I've got the DBX, uh, the actual DBX update. And um, let me see if I can zoom this in. So this is basically the command that you run when you want to update a DBX, uh, which is not super easy, and it also involves you having to go to uefi.org, you download a DBX update from them, then you have to get another PowerShell script that essentially takes that DBX update file apart into two files, so there's this content bin, and there's the signature validation for that, uh, that DBX update. Um, then, so after you've done those steps, then you come into an administrative PowerShell session and you drop it in here and you run it. And what it's done is it's essentially, you'll notice this DBX, let me see if I can zoom that in for you too. Oh, apparently I can't zoom in on a PowerShell screen. 
So what it basically does, it says, okay, it's written the DBX, it's added more stuff into the DBX uh, uh, database. So now um, this will look a little weird um, because for time I didn't want to, to like fix it and take it apart and then do it over again. Um, this is essentially, let's assume, because of the way the DBX update is done, um, had I had a completely updated DBX before I did that demonstration with the, the F Society mask, um, this is the same behavior it would have, right? You can't update the DBX post-exploitation because it checks signatures of bootloaders every time it reboots. So um, we're not cheating the system, we're just doing this for time. So now if we say we restart this, with our, this is the May update of 2023, the most recent DBX update that's available. So it's going to boot, or it's going to try to boot, and it's going to do, uh, there we go. Selected boot image did not authenticate. Please press the key to enter to try your next device. So at this point, say if I was the end user and I had just, you know, opened an attachment that I shouldn't have, um, when my machine rebooted, now I'm at the point where I'm having to call my IT support and say, hey, what happened? Like, I'm getting a secure boot message. There's something broken. So this is secure boot actually doing its job. And if we try to hit, it, hit it, enter to do the next boot device, it's just going to fail again. Um, yeah. So you're basically stuck in this loop of not being able to, uh, not being able to boot. Um, so that is basically the demo. I'm going to save you from watching me reset the keys to factory values. Um, there is a way to get around this as, a, as an administrator, but you have to drop into a command shell. You have to have edit manu manually change which bootloader is, is used. Um, it's, it was complicated the first time I did it. So, you know, trying to have a, an average, your average user who's not, not fluent in technology do this is um, non-trivial, let's say. But there you go. Back to you, Randy. Okay, so um, it's really cool to see that uh, in real life. And what's different about this as opposed to uh, Black Lotus, Nate? The only real difference to this is that um, in this specific instance, while I, I do have another version that drops an actual, uh, like a Trojan, and then calls back to uh, a command and control system. Just due to the nature of the setup here, that wasn't really feasible to use that version of it. But this essentially does um, the exact same thing. Um, it's, it's, it's not abusing the vulnerability that Black Lotus used, but it's basically taking advantage of the, the root of it um, because we don't need to abuse that, that bootloader vulnerability. And obviously, as I showed, my system's fully patched as of what June or May of 2023. So I do still have the patch from January 2022 where Microsoft fixed it. But without the, the, the updated DBX, um, it didn't actually stop it. And, and an interesting point to sort of harp on them about Black Lotus is that they didn't. Uh, so I, I have all of the historical DBX updates from UEFI.org and they fixed that in January 2022. Um, they didn't update. There was no, uh, as you mentioned, no DBX lists for that specific vulnerability published until May. So even though they updated it in August and September for actually some vulnerabilities that my researchers here at Eclipsium found, um, and again in March, none of those updates addressed this vulnerability. Um, they have uh, officially started patching it and you, you can see some information about that in the May, the May Patch Tuesday, Microsoft put out a blog about it. The, it's even more complex than what I just showed you. It involves putting a, installing a special secure boot policy, installing the DBX update. Uh, it is not reversible once you do it. There's no way to back out. And it also in the process invalidates all offline boot material or boot, uh, boot instances. So if you say, you know, deploy Windows to your machines via PXE, or you have rescue disks or any of these other things, by putting that, that fix on, you're essentially locked in. You use no way to restore Windows to, you know, to set it back to, you know, wipe it and refresh it for a new employee or but correct, fix a corrupted instance. It's um, very perilous, I would say. Uh, I'm certainly not doing it on my machines until they get it right. Yeah, and um, these are not updates that you can push out via like Intune or group policy either. 
I don't, I'm not super familiar with Intune. I, I imagine if you have the ability to run remote PowerShell scripts, you could do it. Um, the tricky part is, it's just, it's, there's just a, there's a significant risk of something going sideways. Uh. Yeah, well, I guess what I meant was these are not just things that you load up in an administrative template and yeah. uh, and click uh, click through and say yes, do this in Intune. You know, the, yeah, you've got to code this up in PowerShell, test it, and then push it out. Yeah, you would have to push it out via Intune, and then if anything goes wrong, you've got a bricked system out there. So, yeah. Exactly. yeah. Um, now, I want to answer a few more questions that are specific to Black Lotus, but then I want to expand this because, you know, Black Lotus is only one example or one iteration of the overall problem that we're talking about here. Um, but first, let's, uh, uh, Let's take Craig's question. Is Defender Tamper Protection turned on? This was a question that came up during uh, your demo. Um, and are Defender configuration settings dialed up, or are they at the default home user settings? Um, on this machine, it's because it's it's uh, just Windows 10 Pro. I, it's just using the standard Defender settings. Um, I will mention that uh, for a, a customer instance, we tested this with a fully dialed up CrowdStrike Falcon uh, install, and Falcon was completely oblivious to it. Um, so there is some there is some stuff we've had to do when we use uh, like with Defender. Defender never catches the actual attack, and we've tested it with on a, uh, my colleague's machine has the full fully Defender like all the knobs turned to eleven. Um, the one thing that we were had we had to do was to we we had code that would actually uh, add um, uh, uh, folder exceptions so where we were dropping the trojans and where we were dropping the malware we would just go in during that portion where it's you know flashes up on the screen and then reboots it as we're shutting off bitlocker we'd also disable we'd say okay here's the folders we're storing our malware I'll just tell defender not to scan those things and it would and we dropped malware and we came back up and it had no idea that it was there so yeah this we're able to do pretty much anything we want uh, as administrative with administrative permissions. The other thing that I would again stress is this whole ta this whole attack presupposes or um, you know has the prerequisite that the attacker has admin authority, uh, and so if that's the case then we're typically going to be able to turn off things like those defender tamper protection settings. Now, it may get more difficult if via uh, Intune and a MDM policy, we've mandated that those things are turned on. But at the end of the day, if you've got admin authority, then one of the immutable laws of computer security is you can get around anything. So it's going to then devolve to how sophisticated is the attacker yeah and it's and the thing that's that's unfortunate and in um, many years i worked for the msrc um being able to elevate to admin is essentially we it's almost considered just a given if an attacker is on a windows machine elevating to admin is not the hard part of what they're going to do um you, you could do this with you could do this without user interaction as well right we make this something so that a user can see it but if i you know if you open your malicious word document you know, I get a, some sort of a C2 channel into your machine. I could do the same thing at a command line without you knowing it, and it would it would work the same way. Uh, let's see here. So Bradley asks, who's behind Black Lotus? So my understanding, it's a uh, it's, a, it's something like a ransomware gang. Uh, it's part of the whole. Um, you know, uh, dark web, black market of malware as a service. Yeah. And go ahead, Nate. Go yeah, ahead. we don't, it's, we're not in, nobody seems to be entirely sure who is behind it. Um, and when this, when the, we, we got at Eclipse and we got some, we got some, we heard rumors of this back in the fall. And it was, you know, at, at the time it was, hey, someone's selling this universal boot kit, root kit for all versions of Windows. And they only wanted like $5,000 for it, which, 
is like nothing in the world of malicious software when exploits go for you know six or seven figures um so a lot of people in the industry were like ah this is probably just some kid trying to make money and rip off a few people uh, as it turns out it was a legitimate thing um whether who who's behind it we're not sure and i haven't yet heard of somebody successfully using this in a ransomware campaign obviously that's not to say that it won't happen i just haven't heard if it has yeah um adam says does this attack work against virtual machines in the cloud like azure aws or does it only work on physical servers and desktops um so we haven't tested it i, I believe uh, i believe if you're running with because i know that the microsoft has at least with hyper v there's um what is it they call like generation two virtual machines that actually have uefi and a virtualized tpm i believe um, in theory, it should work there too. Uh, we just haven't we haven't tested it on those. Right, um, and I would agree with that. Uh, with my research on Black Lotus, um, it 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 seems as though it's uh, viable on VMs, but um, that is one area where you know Microsoft, I think, has an accelerated schedule for implementing the the DBX is on uh, VMs in their cloud. But um, mm -hmm. don't don't quote me on that. Yeah, most likely they most likely they have done something. Uh, I I was in I was involved with their patching process for Azure, and they 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 have a very interesting process that they they keep Azure far more up to security uh, standards than most uh, Windows machines in the world. Now, Nate, did you share that research that you did about um, out of date um, uh, DBX not, files? Not yet, not yet. I'm still I'm still kind of like uh, elbows deep in it. And but I, what I was interesting that the interesting stuff that your audience may find um so what i did is based on like a telem the telemetry that we have from um like rn customers where we get we can see you know the the configuration of uefi and the, the dxe drivers and the the db and dbx uh details i pulled uh 1.1 million machines uh dbx contents basically which is the the, the list of um, revoked hashes and I was actually trying, I was going to build you some slides, Randy. Uh, however, the skew was so horrific that the slides didn't actually make any sense. Um, essentially, what I found was across these 1.1 million machines, um, there is 34 different configurations of their DBX databases, which is, uh, I haven't figured out why yet, because there's only about, uh, let's see, there's what, uh, two, four, six, there's eight official UEFI.org releases. So I suspect that some of these are manufacturers putting their own stuff in there. Um, you know, there's nothing, there's no um, standard as to what each machine has to ship with, right? So um, this Hewlett Packard machine, when I looked at the default, it was running with something from, I believe it was January of 2021. And the machine was shipped, I think they started selling them in March, April of 2021. So it was already a few months outdated. But the long and short of it is, as I dug through the, the list of these DBXs being used by people, um, the most up-to-date one from May, I believe, is 370-something records. The most, uh, the largest number that I saw anybody in this million set using was 267, and there were 68 machines out of a million that had it. Um, the large percentage of them, so out of that million plus, uh, 930,000 of them were using between 77 or 83 uh, revoked. So anywhere from what, a fifth to a fourth of what the current list is. So yeah, but pretty much all of these are horrifically out of date. So what that means is, is even if UFI.org publishes a new DBX, we have no idea if that's made it onto endpoints or not, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, it would be an interesting experiment to go and buy like a laptop in a few months and see if, or like, like say a brand new Dell that was just released in the next few months and see what DBX they're installing it with from the factory, um, if it's actually current or how out of date it is. 
but yeah, the end of the day, there these things are shipping with whatever. I mean, with with UEFI and Secure Boot, they have to ship with something. Um, what that is, it varies crowd quite uh, significantly. And then updates, um, as best I can tell, they aren't happening. Um, now, how is it that you are able to get this kind of information? I don't think have we talked about what Eclipsium does. Yeah, so I don't know that we've talked in this in this webinar about what we do, but we essentially have our, our platform is uh, it's a SaaS platform that you deploy to your endpoints, your servers, your clients, and what it does is it snapshots your firmware configuration. So it looks at your BIOS versions on all of the components. It looks at your UEFI configuration. It looks at the hashes of the different UEFI variables. Um, DBX and DB are two UEFI variables also sometimes referred to as GUIDs. Um, so what it does is it snapshots the configuration of, of the machine and allows you to see your whole fleet in the, the SaaS web portal um, where you can then see, okay, is, you know, am I running out of date firmware? Is my BIOS outdated? Um, in this instance, I actually was looking at something before this call. My own personal laptop, I just realized, needs a DBX update, which I'll be doing when we get off this call. Um, and then it also can check bootloaders. So one of the things that some of the selling point we used with this demonstration was that we were able to bypass CrowdStrike's Falcon, um, but we did pick up, you know, after we scanned the machine when it came back online, it was able to detect, okay, somebody's tampered with your bootloader, there's a malicious bootloader on your machine. So that's, we are kind of targeting the, you know, I hate to use e e EDR, AV as the analogy, but it's similar to that, only it's the layer underneath where your AV and EDR sort of stop looking. Right, right. Well, it's, it's, it's everything above the operating system. It's the firmware. So it's basically Eclipsium gives you, tell me if I've got this right, gives you visibility into the state of firmware on your servers and your other endpoints. Yes, that's absolutely true. Well, this has been great. I really appreciate you putting this whole demonstration together, Nate. Um, you want to just talk a little bit about um, the threat landscape report and some of the research that you guys published there at Eclipsium? Um, yeah, I um, I say that the probably the most interesting, and this this kind of ties into our platform. Uh, the most interesting thing that we published recently was last week. Uh, we released a blog, and it was kind of all over the news. We found a uh, essentially a manufacturer backdoor in uh, Gigabyte motherboards. And the interesting thing about this, as you mentioned with UEFI, and you uh, you'd even mentioned that. You know, some of these drivers are, are harder, like you said, I think you mentioned low jacks, which is harder to detect. Um, what this backdoor, and it's documented as an official manufacturer thing, um, I will, I'm not going to just, I'm not going to, um, you know, comment on, on that or the, the, the sort of <laughs> thought process that went into it. But what it did is it used a, it used a DXE driver, which is another component in UEFI. Um, this DXC driver during boot up, um, if you had enabled a certain setting or forgot to disable the setting in your in your your BIOS settings, BIOS UEFI settings, somewhat um, somewhat the same thing when we're talking about hitting escape and then fiddling with things. So what it would do is, if it was enabled, it would essentially copy a binary into the System32 directory of Windows. Um, register it as a service, and this is happening during the boot process. Before Windows is started, it basically drops this binary, registers as a service, and starts it up. And then when Windows boots, this update service is now running. And it didn't tell you that it installed it. You probably have no idea that it's there. And then this thing was going, and it was calling out to Gigabyte servers looking for code to run. It was basically looking for updates of some sort. Um, the problem, the real problem that we found was that it was both, it was reaching out over HTTP, which is obviously a very bad thing, um, but then it was also not performing any sort of signature validation. So it would perform, um, the binaries that it would download and, and run obviously had to be signed just due to the Microsoft sign code signing requirements, but uh, Gigabyte wasn't checking that the binaries that it were running actually came from Gigabyte. So this kind of opens the door to if you're able to breach someone's network, 
um, this is right for using a man in the middle attack where you say, okay, I can just, you know, this thing goes looking for these different uh, IP addresses, or in one case, it was looking for like a local LAN path of like backslash, backslash, update, dash, SAN, backslash, file path, right? So you didn't even have to spoof DNS. You could do the link local DNS stuff uh, in, in a network. Um, but it would just take a binary, and as long as it's signed with something, which we go and use, we go and use leaked certificates to sign code all the time in our demos because Microsoft can't revoke, they cannot revoke code signing certificates without an update. So a lot of these old certs that have been lost or stolen and posted online, you can still sign it, and Windows will still say, yep, this is a validly signed binary because the signature was at some point valid, and it doesn't check uh, certificate revocation lists. So, that was one of the more interesting things that we found uh, in the last few weeks. Um, and then our, our, our threat report is, is kind of a lot higher level. Uh, I like to geek out on the details stuff. So um, if anybody's interested, I'd say go check out the website and read that there. Um, awesome. I just had to bring this page up because I, I think it communicates so much. So this is UEFI.org, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this page, uh -huh. Nate. But here is where the DBX files are. Um, and this is the latest posted May 9th. So that's a month ago. That's the latest. But uh, check out how often they are uh, published. I think this yeah. is pretty, pretty interesting. Where, yeah, here's the archive. So previous March of this year, previous to that, September of last year, and then August of last year, April of the year before. So <laughs> it can take a long time for something to even show up in this file. Yeah, I think that a lot of, I think that the delays, well, I should say the delays in the early years, because you'll notice it goes from, I think, 2014 to like 2019. So there's like a four or five year gap back into the very bottom of that list. The delays to me sort of indicate that this was not as big of a problem a few years back as it is becoming now, right? So that, you know, in 2022, there was what, August, September, and there's March of this year, May of this year, like they're in, they're having to update it more and more frequently because these attacks are increasing in frequency. Yeah, and it's because the code is so, so vulnerable. Um, you know, I, th I think part of it is there needs to be pressure on hardware vendors to get their firmware programmers trained and get quality control um, secure coding processes put in place. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, the running joke, at least in, in this field, is that when you look at firmware, you're finding like circa like 1999, 2000 vulnerabilities in code that's running modern stuff, right? There's you know, in some situations, uh, some IoT things, some of the stuff, it's, it was just resource constraints, right? They don't have enough processor or memory to do things like ASLR. Um, but that's that's ceasing to be quite as <laughs> um, you don't need You don't need to worry about ASLR when you allow um, variables to be set that are intended only to be used in the factory while the system is being uh, manufactured. Remember, that's, that's one thing we got yep. into with our previous webinar. Yeah, 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 and I think I think some of it is just that it's becoming it's it's an interesting area. I mean, I find this fascinating um, here, and it's 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 interesting to people, and it's the bar is lowering, right? It used to be firmware level attacks were you know it was Sandworm, it was the NSA, it was nation states really were the only people that could do it, and now you know these tools are coming out, people are finding they're looking for vulnerabilities in this area, they're posting proof of concepts to GitHub. So, you know, what used to take, you know, lots and lots of money and very smart people working for government, you know, I wouldn't be surprised in the least if the Black Lotus author is a 16-year-old kid in, like, Pakistan. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Well, on that note, let's just close with saying limit local admin authority and know the state of your firmware. Um, if folks want to see how you can help them know the state of the firmware on their systems, they can get a demo there from uh, just sending an email to info at eclipsium.com. Anything else you'd like to throw out there before we go? Um, no, I, I think it's, as always, man, it's very, it's always cool to hang out with you, Randy, and, and talk shop. Well, thanks a lot, everybody, and uh, have a great day, and uh, we'll be in touch again soon. Bye-bye for now.
Thanks, everyone.